the School of Culture, History and Language at ANU. I'm also one of the conveners of our seminar series. First of all, please allow me to take this opportunity to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respect to the elders past and present. Also, I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to all the traditional custodians to the many lands of our attendees around the world. The ANU China Seminar Series is a forum for discussion of China and also about the Sinophone world. It is organized by the Chinese uh, the Australian Center on China in the World at ANU. And our speakers usually come from different disciplines in and outside of our university. And of course, we welcome audience from various backgrounds too, either members of academic staff from many fields, undergrad and postgrad students, policymakers, or interested members of the public. Um, you're all welcome to join us. The seminar usually runs fortnightly between 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Thursdays. Um, and this seminar actually runs during the annual teaching periods. So during the COVID lockdown, we try to move our talks online. But if restrictions were eased, we would like to still organize seminars on campus with the option of streaming as well. Therefore, local audience will have the opportunity to engage with our speakers in person, but audience of far could also join us through Zoom. So please keep an eye on our programs and advertisements on the future seminars. Um, before we start, we just want to have some like housekeeping um, issues um, kind of talk about here. So the today's seminar is going to totally um, last for one and a half hours and between 45 to one hour that will be the speaker's talk and then after that will be the Q&A session. So for the Q&A session we run like people are free to ask questions directly to the speaker. However, if you want to, please um, unmute yourself. And also, um, hopefully you can raise hand so I can kind of have a little bit of sense of order who comes first and later. And those who don't want to directly ask uh, speakers or questions, um, please also take the function of chats in the Zoom. So you can also just put your questions in written form in the chat box, and then we will try to communicate with the speaker and try to, you know, uh, perceive these interactions. Anyway, so these are the how we are going to run the seminar. And today we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to have Dr. Wen Ting Cheng with us, presenting her new research on a very interesting and important topic about China's efforts to establish an environmental framework along its Belt and Road Initiative. Dr. Cheng is Grand Challenge Research Fellow based at the ANU College of Law. Dr. Cheng had a profound legal training in international economic law and intellectual property law. She worked at the Development and Research Center of Chinese State Intellectual Property Office for five years before coming to ANU. She has, awarded, she has been awarded PhD at the ANU School of Re Regulation and Governance in 2019 on her project about China in global governance of intellectual property. She was also um, involved in many kinds of research projects, including research projects organized by the Center of European Studies at the ANU as well. And her current research at the Grand Challenge uh, focuses more on different legal and regulatory mechanisms to promote the green transition, green finance, regional environmental goods negotiations, and the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism. And today she's going to present her frontier research entitled Greening the Belt and Road, Talking the Green Investment Principles Seriously, Taking the Green Investment Principles Seriously. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Cheng for her talk. Uh, thank you very much, Sugar, for the uh, very generous introduction. And before I start, I would also like to acknowledge 
uh, the Namibu people, traditional custodians of the land we are meeting today, at least uh, at the ACT, and pay my respect to their past, present, and emerging. Um, so the topic today is about the green investment principle. And it was part of the Grand Challenge project, uh, Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific, which mainly looks at the trade and investment opportunities for the Asia Pacific to um, deploy the large scale and fast and uh, renewable energies. And uh, as we all know, China is, uh, we can see the most important actor in the region. Um, so this focus on trade and investment then bring me to China's new green investment principles for the Belt and Road. And uh, I actually started the topic on the green investment principles by reading a lot of criticisms. And then I started the challenges for the green investment principles. And uh, the argument in the end is not that um, the GIP, the green investment principle is almighty or it is effective. Rather it's that um, because the challenge was, uh, the criticism was really saying that it's the only like, discursive power of China or it's window dressing, it's too voluntary and it's not effective at all. But through the research, and uh, I will discuss it in detail today, we will say that we should to some extent taking the green investment principles seriously. Otherwise, as uh, stakeholders externally, they may miss opportunity to influence China's grand agenda. So this is the outline, this slide is the outline of what I will talk today. I will discuss the background for the um, decarbonization um, in the Belt and Road, and then go through some of the typical criticisms for the for China's uh, climate policies along the Belt and Road and the real challenges from China's own perspective. And then I will discuss the content, the members of the green investment principles and using the theory of nodal governance and see how the green investment principles will make a difference. And, and then I will conclude. So let's start from the background. We can say that this is a map about the members of the Belt and Road countries um, from 2013 to early 2021. We can see that now there are over 114 countries. And uh, it's a network focusing on connectivity. And this connectivity is not only about uh, physical interregional connections of transport or communications or energy infrastructure. It is also uh, intangible connections through policy cooperation, information exchange, and further connecting non-state actors within the net within the network. And from the perspective of international law, I will emphasize this in various places in this talk. That is a disciplinary background that I'm coming from and I will always discuss it from like, what is the legal challenge and what is um, the barrier in international law. So that might, different, that might be different from a lot of the discussions we usually see on this topic from a geopolitical perspective. So from the perspective of international law, the Belt and Road Initiative is not a treaty-based system. So what does that mean? This is a paper that was published last year by Schaeffer and uh, Harry Gall uh, in the journal of this one. 
in the Journal of International Economic Law. So what they were actually arguing is that because from the international law's history, in particular from the 1684 Westphalian system, the treaties, so the principle is that states are, have their sovereignty and uh, sovereign states conclude treaties. That is a major form of international law, but the BRI is not a treaty-based system. So we see a lot of connections what's happening, not in the traditional form of law, if we just see law as international treaties. That's why if we take a kind of doctrinal perspective, we may not see what's happening in the BRI. And that's why I was taking the theoretical perspective of nodal governance to analyze this. And also the imperativeness of decarbonization is huge along the Belt and Road. This is a bit old data, but it shows that the BRI was representing 28% uh, of global carbon emissions and uh, the population or the GDP of this region is only 23%. So that means in the decades to come, the Belt and Road countries may be locked into the fossil fuel dependency. And uh, in the economic literature or all the literature about uh, the predictions of carbon emissions in the decades to come. The Belt and Road uh, Initiative, all these countries will have a huge challenge to for decarbonization. So in this is a study from the Green Finance Institute of Beijing Tsinghua University. And they've predicted that these are different scenarios for carbon emission reduction. And at the top, it's a worst case scenario. And this line is a business as usual scenario. And this is actually the Paris Agreement goal, or at that time was more ambitious about like two degree goal in 2015. So that means about over 60% reduction of, of carbon dioxide emission. And uh, the center also argues that some of the traditional ways of decarbonizing the system is, is not really working. And this figure is about um, China's investment along the Belt and Road over the years. What are the percentage um, of in different types of energies because the, it is about energy because energy is the uh, um, most carbon intensive sector that we've seen so far. So we see that there is a huge peak here. Well, I can't really see clearly in my screen um, here. So it's in 2015, I think it's the peak of coal investment. And then um, since this year, the coal investment is almost zero. So I think this is also a echo about if, if the audience is aware that in the recent uh, UN summit, I think it's last month, President Xi has announced that China will stop investing uh, coal-fired coal power stations overseas. And that was actually happening earlier this year. And uh, that is a decarbonization uh, urgency of, for the Belt and Road. So actually China started the green, to build a green Belt and Road since 2016. And it also started the green finance domestically. So I've just listed some of the key policies that China was 
making effort for this um, green investment. I'd like to draw your attention here as about the guiding opinions on promoting the construction of green belt and road. It reads that um, the and it calls for enterprises to abide by international economic and trade rules and ecological and environmental protection law regulation policy standards of the host country. So this has been kind of being criticized as the bar of environmental protection is not high enough if we are considering that the host countries are most developed countries and some of them are least developed countries and their environmental protection law was not very high. So, and, and afterwards there was the green investment principle for the Belt and Road. It, it was co-initiated by China and a UK in, uh, agency in 2018. And that will be the topics that I'll discuss later. So what's the criticism for China's um, climate policy in general for the Belt and Road? The major policy, the major criticism is, was from um, the environmental lists. So, so uh, all people who were generally concerned about the environmental issues along the Belt and Road. And uh, they call for the highest environmental standards along the Belt and Road, um, both for China and the host countries. And uh, they said without command of treaty, the current capacity building and cooperation is mere window dressing designed to improve China's international image instead of doing something real. But we also see kind of criticism from the host countries. They always put the argument from the perspective of political ecology. Um, and they say that the BRI itself represents unequal power relations. So they have kind of the inherent skepticism um, about the any kind of development intervention in the name of green. So they really say that if you want green development for whose benefits and how the green definition is negotiated. And that was kind of two major criticism for the green agenda along the Belt and Road. And below that, we see, sorry, I've, um, I've revised the slides, but it seems doesn't work. So the practical challenge, the major challenge that China has faced is that um, there is no established practice in international law. So the move of the dirty industry has a very long history for the industrialized countries. And uh, there has been economic literature about the problem of carbon leakage or environmental dumping. And so far, these countries have using bilateral agreements um, to manage these issues. And uh, the recent example is the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism. But so far, all this mechanism was kind of within the WTO system. So it's it's about the management of the imports and imported products. There is no country in the world um, has done what the environmentalists have argued that you impose your domestic higher standards to your outbound investment. No country has done that. So that is not really practical and there is no international treaties 
that China can rely on to impose that kind of higher standard. So that's why all this kind of proposal was for good purposes, but they are not really um, practical from the international law perspective. And the second challenge is about um, China's foreign policy of non-interference. So that has long been the foreign policy principles that China adhered to. And that also means that China should not interfere with other countries' internal affairs. Of course, we have different interpretations about what constitutes internal affairs, but from the Chinese perspective, as, as far as we see from the general practice, it does see that the energy mix or energy policy of the host country or the environmental standards of the host country as their internal affair. So China was itself kind of restrained or refrained from the interference or kind of more proactive way of establishing a higher standards. Um, and we see that in the recent literature, it's talk about the, the evolution of this non-interference policy, but in general, it's still the, it's still the practice. Um, sorry. And the third one is the different demands about the uh, state-owned enterprises, as well as the host countries. The SOEs, the, they can be considered as the agencies for the Chinese state, but they also work for their um, commercial feasibility. So if the, pro if the project cannot be commercially feasible, um, they will not conduct it. And uh, we see that some of the Chinese investors like the Sanxia company or is, yeah, it, it is very focusing on the renewable energy or like hydropower. But we also see that there are traditional uh, fossil fuel based companies. So, we cannot see that there, there is a consistent demand from the Chinese companies. And also the project, at the project level, the host countries are always asking for bidding and there are kind of competition from the SOEs and uh, that will also lead to a risk to the bottom. So, if we put the criticism and the challenges into perspective, we see that this is kind of the China's green or decarbonization goals for the Belt and Road. And then there are environmental concerns that China was not actually imposing the green standards to the Belt and Road countries through treaties. And another criticism from the BI countries themselves saying that the defining of the definition of green should be for the benefit of the host country and the local community and should be through the um, process of negotiation. So it's kind of contradictory with each other. And then here comes the practical consideration that there is no established international legal practice to support the the position of imposing a standard. And also China's itself, China itself is kind of refrain from the um, interfering host countries' internal affairs and uh, the different demands of the SOEs and the, and the, and the host countries. So, in the end, we see that China is not approaching this issue from imposing its own standard. And instead, it takes the road of more um, networked way 
and the green investment principle as an example of the China's approach. And before I go to the green industrial policy, I will just, sorry, not green industrial policy, green investment principle. Um, I will briefly discuss why investment, green investment and green finance is important as a regulatory instrument for decarbonization. Um, as you can see from the literature, it's really a recent uh, focus in the financial sector as well. So the green finance has increasingly been understood as a driving force for sustainability. Um, the general practice is that um, there will be the defined green projects and uh, some of the investors as well as the consumers will lead the investment into the green sector. Um, and uh, instead, as a in a parallel, they also led to the divestment movement which is divestment from the fossil fuel industry. And in this process, the central banks has taken an increasingly important role in understanding how the environmental risk can be considered as financial risk. Um, and also it, it's better that um, the green investment happen in a web of regulation using different regulatory instrument together as compared with just one instrument. So the research question is really against the background that we have discussed all the criticism and the challenge that China has faced so what role do the green investment principles play in building the green belt and road and uh, addressing relevant regulatory challenges? Are they really, as the commentators has saying that to voluntary to be effective or to duplicative to adding value? Uh, the second part of duplication I will discuss later about the existing uh, green investment principles in the area. So as I mentioned from the international law perspective, if we are taking international law as the existing treaties, then the green investment principle as itself is not a treaty. So and uh, it's not really binding for the countries. So that can let, kind of led to the arguments that it's too voluntary to be effective. But here I've kind of drawn to the different body of literature about nodal governance. And uh, it's part of the network theory that explains how a variety of actors operating within the networks and uh, interact with each other to govern the system. Mm. So the governance is saying in the nodal governance theory as, the constitu as constituted in nodes, uh, the nodes are institutions it's being defined as institutions with a set of technologies, um, mentalities and resources that mobilize the knowledge and the capacity of members to manage the course of, uh, the course of event. So the networks are primary means through which the nodes can exert influence. So this theory actually could enable us to see something that we otherwise may ignore uh, from the perspective of saying that international law is only the treaty-based system. And uh, this can be used in the context because 
um, the BRI's network has focusing on the connectivity. So it's naturally how the nodal governance is operating at a network. And the green investment principles itself, um, it was proposed in 2018, and now it has about 39 members. Um, and here is a list of the subscribers. Here we can see that we have um, the Chinese subscribers, mainly in the, the Chinese banks. And within the list, you can see that all the major four banks of China, as well as the export and import bank as, and uh, other policy banks also included. And the non-Chinese subscribers, including major banks in France, Japan, uh, as well as in Germany. And the supporters are really, um, the, we see the big four accounting companies of the world and uh, other subscribers. So the principle are kind of simple in a way that it only have th seven principles. Um, and the first two principle is about embedding the concept of sustainability into corporate governance. This means um, the corporate governance of the subscribers, many these banks. And uh, the principle three is at the center actually. It requires the disclosing of um, environmental information. This is the uh, kind of most important practice so far within the um, green investment principles for this one, as well as for um, others like the principle for responsible investment, as well as the equitable principle. And uh, then it's the communication with stakeholders as you within the governance of the corporation. And the last three was mainly about how the financial sector, these banks can influence through its own networks of using green finance instruments to, to influence the entire uh, value chain to support green value, green supply chain, and uh, to promote capacity through collective action. Um, here I have a simple comparison between this one, the green investment principle of the BRI here and other investment principles. So we see that there are a lot of overlap between the GIP and the PRI. So the principle of uh, responsible investment was initiated by the United Nations and so far the most influential one. You can see that the, the members of this one is really big. It's about uh, 3,000 and it was established in 2006 but the content of the two are by and large the same. And equitable principle was um, initiated by IMF. And uh, so far this one, you see that it has some more specific mechanisms. And so far it's the most stringent principle in the area. Um, yeah, so how from the nodal governance perspective, China could influence through the green investment principles. So the nodes or the different actors within the system as the focus of the theory, we see that uh, in the nodal governance, the most important actor, of course, is the Chinese state. 
And then we have the BRI countries of different size and different economic and social state kind of development status, as well as the financial institutions and Chinese um, state owned enterprises as um, project implementers. And uh, how it will work. So I find that the unique of, uniqueness of the green investment principle is that it kind of have two dimensions that help China to overcome uh, the restraint of the principle of non-interference, not directly interfering the BRI countries um, environmental protection law. So the two dimensions was, first of all, um, within China, we often say that it's an authoritarian mechanism, so authoritarian system. That means domestically, China has the power to ask the financial institutions to um, implement very stringent or to at least to implement its domestic um, green finance principle. And then these financial institutions, they are the major founder for not all, but I've seen the data about 86% of the BRI investment. And uh, if this sets the funding rules saying that we are divest from the fossil fuel industry, then the coal-fired um, power station cannot get found. So this is how the, the, the green investment principle for the Belt and Road has made a difference. So through these two dimensions that China can indirectly influence the project and making them um, divest from the fossil fuel industry and at the same time without interfering the domestic legal system, environmental law of the BRI countries. I kind of identify like the three conditions for the GIP to work. So the first of all, first of, all of course, is the authoritarian logic of implementing green finance policies within China. So that means all the countries should abide by the, mm, the laws within China. And then the Chinese bank, in particular, the Chinese Central Bank, People's, pa People's Bank of China, it has the vast foreign currency reserve. So that helps um, the GIP actually work. It controls money and it controls money for the financial institutions within China to work. And then the third, fact, third aspect is that the Chinese public funds account for the majority of the overseas investment. And uh, another observation is that GIP is not alone. So first of all, the, we can see the diversity of the membership. Half of the GIP signatories are non-Chinese banks. So the having external or non-Chinese banks means that the best practice of other countries can flow into the network. On the other hand, they also kind of monitor the system to getting greener. And also the GIP kind of um, bridge the Chinese banks to higher standards. As we have discussed, the equitable principle was actually a higher standard than the GIP. And through the GIP, some of the Chinese banks 
was saying that if green finance is really what we are pursuing, so what will be the highest standard? And I have seen the data that before the GIP, there were only like one bank, they call it the Equator Bank. But in the last couple of years, at least seven bank has registered to the higher standard. And that is also kind of in, the, in a way that within China, they can differentiate themselves from other um, kind of green banks. Uh, and also we see that China is also very active in, in other networks, G20. So from 2016, China was part of the G20 uh, Green Finance Research Group and uh, still within that group. And uh, it's a co-chair of the group now. And also the central banks and uh, the NGFS, the network for central banks and supervisors for green finance system, as well as uh, IPSF. So these are all um, I've discussed in the paper that um, what we call in the nodal governance, it's kind of superstructure nodes that will let the information flow, let the best practice flow, and then to help uh, capacity building. So the GIP in terms of green finance as part of a bigger network. And also, um, as we mentioned that international treaties are binding for countries. And in this case, the GIP is, if we, if we read the seven principles, they're open-ended and kind of abstract and voluntary. So how will this impact the effectiveness? I'm thinking this really hard through the writing of the paper. And uh, then I came across the concept of the framework agreement, and then we can still see some value here. So, so if we compare the GIP with the uh, with, uh, PRI, the principle of responsible investment, we see that the GIP is still emerging and it's in its early, early stage. So, there are opportunities for the for the um, actors or subscribers within it to to improve or to participate in the building of of the content of this principle, and also um, as a framework agreement, it actually sets a baseline for which the the countries will build consensus and uh, to build more prescriptive uh, and compliance uh, provisions in the future. And also it's a good opportunity for building the capacity through collective action. Um, I can give you one example about the capacity building. So which is the, um, this one, the climate and environmental risk assessment toolbox. So if you go to the GIP website, you, you will see this toolbox online. The principles themselves are kind of vague and abstract, but through the very detailed parameters within this toolbox, they kind of help all the subscribers to know that how the physical risks um, of the climate system will transform into a financial risk. So um, if you go to the website, you, you will know what I've said. So if you enter into the different parameters of the factors, then it will kind of assess uh, how the project, how green the project it is. And that is the effort of the GIP to be more uh, specific 
and that is also a way that it provides the uh, subscribers some of the capacity to to assess uh, their investment. And uh, last but not least, so we talk about a lot of um, green investment and whether success or not, that depends on how green it is. And uh, there is a real risk of greenwashing. So what will happen if a project they claim that the investment is towards um, green project, but in the end, it's not. So that ends up with um, how green is defined. And there has been a lot of criticism about this is domestic China's green bonds um, catalog in 2015 that uh, a lot of fossil fuel um, in investment was included, including the renovation of fossil fuel power stations, etc. Here is a table about what's happening this year. So in April this year, there has been a uh, overall uh, revision of the catalog. We can see in particular here that the clean energy industries was really, these are the atoms that has been deleted. So major fossil fuel based projects has been eliminated from the clean energy industries. And uh, we see some of the new items were added. Of course, nuclear is controversial, not only in China, but other parts of the world, of course, and also carbon capture and storage. So this comparison shows that the green standard is important and uh, China is actually making an effort to use the more stringent stand standard for its own domestic investment. But through the GIP, what we will say is that the Chinese banks will abide by this new catalog. And then it will also apply to um, its overseas investment. So this is how the GIP could make a difference. And other, other efforts towards the carbon, towards the more stringent standards, including China's carbon market, started operation from um, July this year, as well as different uh, provisions about carbon peak and carbon neutrality at different levels, of course. And China's new announcement um, to uh, walking away from the uh, new coal-fired power stations. So this is a conclusion of the paper that I've discussed. Um, the major conclusion is a moderate one, I would say. It's, as I mentioned, it's not saying that um, the green investment principle is magic and it will make a huge difference. It's really saying that because it can be considered as a network of framework agreement and uh, through the two dimensions of the network, the green investment principle uh, could make a difference. And uh, it is a kind of pra practical solution for China to meet with its a practical challenge, both that there is no established uh, practice internationally, as well as um, as well as its foreign policy rest restraints of non-interference. Um, and GIP should be taken seriously as an important network to forge more stringent environmental standards. And last but not least, I would like to show 
Oh, sorry, I have another slide that, that was not added. So I was wanting, after I review the entire slides, I, I was saying that maybe it's better to give a positive example about how other countries was actually, not other countries, how the agencies was actually influencing China very well, engaging China very well. It's about, it's, it's an institution called the CBI, the Climate Fund Initiative. So what's happening, as I mentioned previously, is that the green standard is essential. So the CBI actually engaged with China uh, through education and also naming and shaming. So it in the website, it shows the differences of its own standard of green bonds and the Chinese green bonds. And then it pushed China to adopt uh, the more stringent standard in the end. So that's why I was saying that if we take the green investment principle seriously and uh, actively engage with China, uh, there will be more opportunity to influence a greener belt and road. Um, I think that's all of the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful um, presentation and about this comprehensive project.